In this video, I'd like to talk about more complex forms of inheritance when multiple genes are involved. Uh, so this is what we've gone through so far, uh, different kinds of autosomal and X-linked dominance, uh, mitochondria and Y-chromosome imprinting, um, and we talked about uh, cases where there's not clear dominance, uh, and even neutral mutations. Um, and so then the question is, uh, can we ever, so we talked a lot, in, in all these cases we observe one or two alleles, and so the next question would be, um, can there ever be more than two alleles? Um, so let's take a detour here. What do we mean by more than two alleles? Um, so in this case, I'm talking about the alleles observed in a phenotype in an individual. So because we only have two copies uh, of each gene um, that we inherited from our parents, that means the most possible alleles that an individual can have is two. Um, so it's worth pointing out that uh, genes can have more than two alleles. And we already know that, we just maybe haven't obsessed about it or thought about it. So remember like in lactase and bacteria, uh, within the lactase gene, um, we had RBS minus, um, CBS minus, and L minus. Uh, within the lactase repressor in bacteria, we had R or R minus or the super repressor. So we actually know that a single gene can have more than two alleles, even if we haven't been emphasizing it. Uh, and so one classic case here is blood type in humans. And you may have heard of A blood types, B blood types, and O blood types. Um, these are actually due to different alleles of a gene. So there's one allele A, which produces um, one surface molecule, shown here in red, one allele that uh, called B, which shows uh, produces a different one. And then you can either, because they're alleles, you can have co one copy of each, and you get both uh, surface molecules. Or if you don't have either of these copies, if you have two copies of the O allele, um, then you won't have any of these surface molecules. <clears throat> so, um, so overall, um, these clearly we can see that um, we can have more than two alleles of the same gene. Uh, but that, that's actually not what I'm talking about here, right? Because we're, we're talking about alleles in an individual. So the most that's going to be is two. Uh, so then if I ask, uh, can we have more than two alleles observed in the phenotype, it sounds kind of like a stupid or a trick question. Um, and that can only be the case if we have more than one gene, right? So if we have more than one gene, then we could have two alleles at one gene, two alleles at another gene, maybe two alleles at the, at the next gene. Um, so we already know that this is the case, even if we haven't thought about it. So when we were talking about lactase expression in bacteria, um, in order to figure out when a bacterium would express lactase, we had to look at multiple different genes, right? So we had to look at the allele or alleles at the repressor gene, the allele or the alleles at the permease gene, and so forth. So the trait of expression of lactase in bacteria, either expressing or non-expressing or sometimes expressing, um, depended on looking at multiple genes. So we know, even if we haven't emphasized it, that a trait can depend on more than one gene. Uh, so a classic case uh, of a trait that involves more than one gene is height in humans. So here we have a distribution of people lined up by height from five foot uh, to six foot five, and it kind of gives this this classic bell-shaped uh, distribution. Um, so what we call these are, are continuous traits here where not only can you be five foot zero or five foot one, you can be five foot uh, and 0.2 inches or 0.3 inches. So we have a, a wide range of values. You can be um, seven foot tall and you can be four feet tall and you can be anywhere in between. Um, and so we call this a continuous distribution. So in statistics, this is, this is what we mean by continuous. So this is different than discrete, right? For discrete, that's only when we can have certain values. You can have an A, a B, an AB, or an O blood type, or you can have lactase that's either expressed always, never, or sometimes. Um, so we don't want to get too hung up on this distinction. It's a very useful distinction, but you might say like, well, uh, it, are things really discrete? Because you could probably imagine alleles in the lactase circuit that would not either be always, um, always, sometimes, or never, but maybe they'd be a little bit, right? That you could have like a leaky allele, and then it wouldn't be a discrete trait, it would be a continuous trait. So, so that's correct, that's good thinking. Uh, it's still useful to think about uh, discrete cases because we think about them differently. Uh, and then the third would be a binary trait, which a binary trait is basically a discrete trait that has exactly two different states. 
So uh, the ones we did with, with the virtual genetics lab and just in general autosomal and recessive simple cases, uh, we can call those binary traits. Okay, so then if we focus in on this continuous uh, distribution trait of height, um, let's see how this works. So here we have our karyotype with our 46 chromosomes. Um, and so height, it turns out, is a polygenic trait. That means that there are many genes. Uh, here we're going to do five, I think, but uh, overall it, seems, it looks like it's more than 30. Many genes that are influencing human height. So that would mean somewhere on this karyotype, maybe here on chromosome 2, uh, we'd have a gene that has two different alleles, A1 and A2. Um, or rather, we can call them A1 and A2, right? They're, this is our choice. We, let's go ahead and call this gene A with alleles 1 and 2. And then over here, we'd have some other gene uh, where we have two alleles, B1, and we can call them B1 and B2. And then some other gene where we have some alleles, and maybe there are more alleles at this gene. Again, we can have more than two alleles at a gene. Um, so that would mean in the population, we have these four different copies that have four different impacts on height. Uh, and so let's say we have five genes in total. So we're geneticists, so we can, uh, we can choose things to make our lives easier. Um, which one we call A1 and which one we call A2 doesn't matter. So let's just make it that all the ones or the low numbers um, will be genes that or alleles that when present uh, make a person more likely to be somewhat shorter. Okay, so the low numbers um, are genes associated with short stature, and the higher numbers are genes associated with tall stature. So then that would mean that, that if you have an individual who has lots of high numbered alleles, so alleles 2 here, alleles 3, alleles 2, that we'd expect this to be a very tall individual, uh, whereas if we have all ones, all the ones associated with shortness, we'd expect a very short individual. Uh, and then if we have something in between, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 2, uh, we might expect an individual with medium height, and there'd be all kinds of different combinations that we could have for individuals uh, that we'd expect to have medium height. Okay, so here then what we're talking about is a bunch of different genes uh, with alleles, all of which have an effect on this single trait of human height. Um, and so that could mean that um, uh, if we looked in the population and actually looked at these different genes, we can work out, uh, we can estimate how big of an effect each allele has. And so we'd end up with a pattern like this, uh, where we'd say, okay, at gene one, if you have allele one, then um, you'll be on average about negative 0 0.1 inches, uh, sorry, 0 0.1 inches shorter than the average. And if you have allele 2, you'd be 0.03 inches taller than the average. For B, if you, you'd be, if you have allele 1, negative 0.2, uh, allele 2, plus 0.1. So, and, and the, the values, we do expect them to look like this. They're not all going to be the same, right? Because height is a complex trait that has to do with all kinds of physiological, metabolic um, growth patterns. And so different genes are going to have different size effects. So as I've drawn it here, we have some genes with very large effects. So the differences of, of, of alleles here, um, I'm saying, could make up to a couple of inches of difference. Uh, whereas we have other genes that are very small effect, um, where the alleles may only make a difference of 0.1 inches. Okay, so then that means for a given individual, uh, let's say for a given, given woman, um, there'll be two, uh, we have our, our two alleles at each gene. Um, and so then we can work out what we would predict her height to be. Um, so, okay, she has two allele ones. So that means she has two po negative 0.1 effects. Uh, and then at allele B, sorry, at gene B, she has two one alleles, B1 and B1. Uh, so she'd be negative 0.2 and another negative 0.2. At gene C, she has two allele C1s and so, so forth. So then we would predict... Um, basically, uh, that she would have the average, so, th so this is all relative to the average height. The average height for a woman is, is 5 foot 4 inches. Um, and so if we add all these together, we get negative 3.5 inches. So then we would predict uh, that she would be 5 feet and 0.5 inches. Uh, but then um, height is also a complex trait in that, as I'm sure you're thinking, the environment is also important. So... Um, 
people who are raised in very nutritious environments um, uh, that have access to a lot of, of uh, high nutrition food uh, will tend to be taller, even given the same genotype, uh, than individuals who are raised in poor environment, environments. And so to work out this individual's height, we'd also have to know something about the environment. And so the environment is also going to make a contribution. So if this individual was raised, um, basically raised with enough food, uh, then this individual would be five foot two about. Um, whereas if this individual was raised in an impoverished environment, um, even with the same genes, this individual would end up somewhat shorter. Uh, so we could do an example of a man. So here we're going to take the average height of a man and add in all these contributions. Uh, here it's not just all A1, A1, B1, B1, C1, C1, uh, but different alleles. And then we can add all these together and we get a total of 1.2. Uh, and then again, this man's environment will play a role. So we get 510 plus 1.2 inches plus the role of the environment. And so the individual might end up at 6 foot and 0.2 inches. Okay, so even this complex, this complex situation here where we're having to take into account 10 alleles drawn from 1, 2, 3, 4, 8, 10, 13 possibilities at 5 genes, even that is somewhat simplified. So um, one way that it's simplified is that it needn't be the case that each allele acts uh, independently. So w the way that we did it on the previous slide um, was we just had these two different effects, negative 0.1 and plus 0.03. So that would mean if you have two allele ones, it's just negative 0.1 and negative 0.1 or negative 0.2. If you have one of each, then it's just negative 0.1 and plus 0.03. So negative 0.07. And then if you have two, two, you add them together. But it could be the case that it's, uh, that it's somewhat different, right? So uh, in this case, maybe um, in the case that I've shown here, uh, maybe there's only really, there's a very small effect if you have at least one copy of 0.2, uh, but then a large, sorry, one copy of allele 2, A2, um, but a large effect if you have A1, A1, right? So in this case, the two alleles are not additive. Uh, it looks somewhat more like dominance and recessivity. So if you have two copies, only if you have two copies of A1, will you have a strong effect on height. Uh, the other way in which this is simplified is that there could be differences on, on the effect on males and in females. It needn't be the case that if allele 1 uh, causes plus 0.1, that it has to cause plus 0.1 in, in females as well. It could be different between the sexes. So in this toy example I've, I've drawn out here, um, now we have a case where there's only a strong effect of gene 1 in males when it's A1A1. Everywhere else is sort of a small effect between uh, point, yeah, just a difference of 0.16 inter inches, only in this one case do we have a strong effect. Uh, the other thing is that um, it could matter uh, what we have at the other gene. So, um, so epistasis is this phenomenon uh, where the effect of the alleles at one gene on a trait depends on the genotype at another gene. So here, what I've drawn out is, um, let's imagine there's an interaction of some sort between gene one and gene two, uh, such that only we only have a strong effect of, on height um, when uh, we have B1B1 at gene B and A1A1 at gene A. So you'll see that all the other combinations, the effect of, of A1 doesn't matter very much, but then suddenly, um, if the individual is B1B1, um, a1A1 matters more. So th this can get very thick very quickly, um, but that's exactly my point, uh, is to show that polygenic traits, unlike some of the simple traits that we've been studying, or comparatively simple traits, um, can be quite complicated, uh, where you have interactions between genes, you have interactions between alleles, and you have a lot of genes involved. So let's just dig down slightly more on this concept of epistasis. Um, I just want to convince you that you actually already know about this. Um, so again, epistasis is the uh, phenomenon where the effect of one gene on a trait depends on what the genotype is at another gene. So let's think about, for instance, um, the, the L minus mutation in bacteria lactase production. So L minus is just a copy of the lactase gene that does not have 
um, where that does not have an intact copy of the lactase coding sequence and cannot make protein. Uh, so if we have a cell that just, which is wild type, except for being, um, let's say one cell is L, but in otherwise wild type, so a full wild type cell uh, versus a cell that's wild type, but only has this one lactase mutation. Well, this is gonna be the difference between a cell that can and cannot produce lactase. Um, but if we look for it's, uh, if we look at the case where we have cells that have the super repressor, uh, well, as we learn, the super repressor will repress uh, a wild type lactase, and so now suddenly the difference between these two cells, which again the only difference uh, is their genotype at lactase, uh, but now there's no difference in their phenotype. So what we could say is that um, the between these two cases the genotype at the repressor gene, uh, being a super repressor versus being wild type, um, affects how the mutation at lactase matters. So here, the mutation in the lactase gene uh, affects the phenotype a lot, and here, it doesn't affect it at all, because in both cases, uh, it doesn't matter, it can't produce lactase. Um, and then if we look at the case with two different mutations, um, we have uh, we again get back to, um, so now with two cells that both have super repressor and RBS minus, we now get back to a case where L versus L minus does affect our phenotype. And so the main take home point here is the fact of L minus versus L allelic differences. Uh, the effect of this on lactase production uh, is going to depend at the genotype at other genes.